Hello. Ganda ng timing. Ah, sorry. Ano? Clean, React in Rails. It's sort of related to uh, React JS and how we sort of do React JS in, um, in our in our line of work, which is uh, software development at this company. So um, sorry, I have a lot of slides, huh? uh, but if you look at this, all these slides are actually okay. Uh, all these slides are not full screen. Next to the blue ship. Right. Okay. So the only relevant slide in my presentation is actually the first slide. Because the other slides are actually just templates from Google from Google Docs. So I wasn't actually able to prepare some decent slides yet for this presentation. Uh, uh, because, because I had a lot of work, I actually wanted to come here the past few days. I think um, uh, I, I was bugging the admin, but I had to cancel last minute. So uh, here I am now, and then hopefully I can uh, uh, maximize my, my, my time here. So again, my name is Rafael Alambay. I am the co-managing uh, partner of CloudBandSolutions.com. Uh, Co. So we're a software development company in, in the north, so I come from the north, which is also why I can sort of... Um, I, I, our, our office is in Katipunan, and for those of you who have been to Katipunan, the time it takes to go from Katipunan to Katipunan takes around one hour. So um, from, from the end of UP down to even before Katipunan extension, it takes one hour. So the moment I see traffic, uh, I can go pretty much anywhere after, before 10 p.m. So, um, yeah, so my topic is sprinkling React on Rails. And the way I sort of like to talk about this is to show you a current production project that we've been doing for, I think, almost three years now. So, the, my main thesis, so to speak, um, is actually twofold. First one is, I assume that we have some production systems that were built using something like maybe Rails 3 or Rails 4, if we're lucky, um, that didn't know anything about React or any of those fancy JS frameworks yet. So with your typical request response, um, blessing in disguise that it's a simple form gem, so we can have a easier way to bind stuff to our form. But eventually, as your software matures, you have more requirements and you have to add more things to it. And then JavaScript makes things easier, especially when handling complex objects. Right. So, if, for example, if you want to create the registration form, and then that registration form requires some nested uh, models, yes, many, we'll have to do something like uh, accepts, um, uh, yun. <laughs> okay. uh, we have to do some, some, some things, and then we have to bind the nested form, probably use cocoon, all those things. But with React, we can do as, uh, with JavaScript in general, we can make Everything as a single JavaScript object, compile it, not compile it, but um, resolve its state and then submit it to the API and then we save it to the database. So that's the first thing that I'd like to uh, talk about. Now. How we sort of inject the app in Rails uh, without using, as the previous speaker mentioned, the you know, two gems. Um, the second one is, uh, just to contextualize, um, I'll be showing a financial application. And the financial application we're doing is, uh, help well, gone are the days of creating applications that are simply CRUD applications. When I create a record, I save, I update, I delete it. Now we need to have, we need to move to the next generation domain of problems, which I, I believe is blockchain, digital blockchain. Digital blockchain. Um, it's, uh, it's artificial intelligence, at least on my personal level. So the second one I tried to just is how do we introduce um, Data, uh, data science in the Rails context because I'm pro Rails. I have a lot of I have a lot of friends telling me to to jump ship and go to Phoenix um, Phoenix Elixir stack 
And uh, to be quite honest, it's a very, very, very powerful technology, but I don't really need it right now because uh, every other developer is dreaming of creating the next Facebook or Twitter. Uh, for our company, at least, at least we're trying to address the smaller fries, the SMEs. We're trying to create, we're, we pride ourselves in creating internal applications, and we want the best tool that's readily adapted by the environment. So in this case, that would be their MIS team. So, so, so just, a, just as a background, uh, the client we're addressing is a, started as an NGO, and then they transitioned to become a microfinance company, and their quote-unquote IT team are more of the guys that set up routers, cables, and troubleshoot stuff. So uh, I guess my battle cry is to, to be able to inject development in their world so that they can scale their app on their own, even without my help. I don't care if they fire me for, for because they can already do it on their own. At least I, I did my job, which was to introduce programming. And um, Rails is an excellent tool to do that. Okay, so, uh, so even if you have all these nice frameworks, it's very, very hard to go away with the, do away with the things that Rails does, the, the, all the things that we love. Great DB migrate is the next best thing to slice bread. Um, also creating very, uh, very, very fast prototypes of projects. You can do it very, very easily with Rails. So two things also. First, how, we, how I integrate React in our Rails project. And second is how we can introduce artificial intelligence uh, machine learning in the context of Rails. So I'll start with the Rails part. I'll just fire off my project here. Hello. Hello. You can see it. Um, the name of my project is Loner. Uh, it's a loans management system. It's one of the very many, comp one of the um, sort of several components that comprises uh, our, our set of systems. So I guess this is like the core system. The entire, I will see that. Okay. All right, so this is our application. Uh, it's it's uh, if you notice, it's your typical. Uh, it's your, don't mind the numbers; they're not real. Uh, they're dummy data. Uh, you, it's your typical dashboard internal application wherein you have some some statistics, some numbers, ooh, money, and all the things. Um, so if we built if we built this back in two thousand thirteen or two thousand fourteen. The only way we could create those loading things, I'm not sure if you, if you noticed it now. When the page loads, you get loading, you have some Ajax that fetches data from some internal API, some internal API and then renders, it renders the, uh, the data needed into the dashboard. So that's your typical uh, JavaScript application. The problem with this is as your application scales, you get more and more JavaScript uh, in, in in place. So we try to be as organized as possible. So let me just show you an example of how the JavaScript for this page would look like. Okay, so we have our traditional hierarchy for our Rails project. We have app assets, JavaScript. And then let's say for, for the dashboard part, Can't remember where it is. Okay, dashboard.js. So we try to be as clean as possible. So there's this nice tutorial on YouTube as to how to sort of organize your uh, JavaScript. It's not the best, it's not the most professional code, so to speak, but it works for my context. Meaning those trying to get into programming, trying to do the whole monkey patch approach, it kind of works. It, it has some layer of organization for them. So this one is called, if I'm not mistaken, the revealing pattern. So you have a variable right there, dashboard. And what this does is that it's a function that executes itself. And then we try to make it as object-oriented as possible. We have a bunch of variables here. And we have two main methods, a cache method and a bind events method. 
So these two functions, uh, methods, or uh, whatever you like to call them, cache lang is pretty simple. It just stores the uh, needed UI elements coming from our favorite old school J uh, JavaScript framework, jQuery. So we simply query stuff from the DOM, and then bind events does some things like gets the current status, and then to render the page, you actually use mustache.js. So right there, line number 18, mustache.js. Mustache dash dot render, and then you pass the response, which is expected to be the object that you render to the page, and then you have some template to display all these things. So uh, that's the basic gist of it. So um, my, my code developer friend says, oh, there's this thing called React. It's a very beautiful framework. Let's go ahead and transition everything to React. So there are two problems with that. First of all, if you want to use an application purely written in React.js, you have to deal with React's internal routing. I, I tried to study it for a day. I understood it uh, quite, quite um, I, I was able to understand it. But I wasn't confident enough to deploy it in production. And no matter how good the technology is, you still have to have that middle ground between uh, when you would adapt um, a new technology versus what's already in production. Because if I, I, I did the numbers, so one thing in, when, in working in the startup industry is that you wear many hats. Okay, my favorite hat right now is the janitor hat. Because every Thursday, we get to clean the office as janitors. So I learn how to use a mop. I learn how to clean plates. Um, and as you know, it's Thursday today, but I'm here. So I was able to get out of my janitorial duties. Um, but my, my point being is that uh, I learned how to do costing. And when I did costing, um, the amount, uh, my rough estimate for having to transition a three-year-old application to a pure React.js front-end application would cost us around, give or take, six million pesos. That's actually quite small, given the scale of our application. Let's just, let's just put, it, uh, put it like that, if I just crunch the numbers. So it's very expensive, especially for something that's being used in production, even if it's an internal app not being used on the internet. This one actually runs in a local server in 30 branches around Metro Manila that syncs to another server in the head office. Why didn't we go cloud? Simply because the internet is crap in Metro Manila. And we're, we're, in, uh, we're, in, we're deploying in things like uh, marginalized communities, um, uh, the less privileged people in the, in the Philippines, and we're trying to inject technology to it. So there's that niche space that we try to address. And the idea there is that these technologies will make lives easier for the developer, but we have to think about how to make lives easier for our end users. So, so it wasn't, it, um, we wouldn't, trans my point is we wouldn't transition immediately to React. We still kept this code base and we still maintain and improve it. Right? So uh, this type of coding is very, very uh, old school, but it works. It works in a sense that it's still scalable because we don't deal with hundreds of thousands of requests per second. We deal with something like one request per second because they have to encode the form and then submit it. But it serves 30,000 people. So that type of approach will, is actually, uh, you have to have that middle ground between when you would transition to React and when you would keep old school jQuery. Okay. So, Taking this code into consideration, let's now look at another module that actually uses React. So from the system, I go to something like the application form. It's my first time to use Chromecast. Uh, lang talaga siya. Or is it just my computer? Okay. So the main loans, uh, the main loans sort of uh, mode the index of Mojo is actually running React. But it doesn't run, run, run React like most React developers would, would, um, would, uh, would, would, would approach it. Because usually you just have a single application, React application that does everything. Right? This, way, this one just has React, but we just sprinkle it on top of an HTML page. Okay, so let me just show you how this HTML page would, uh, looks like. So the way we do it is, um, the way we do it is we have your typical Rails views, which simply renders a page from a controller. <clears throat> so we have records here, 
index and entropy using Hamel. Entropy using Hamel is if you notice this is your typical HTML. So nothing fancy, right? It's just your HTML that gets rendered from a layout. Right? And this is where the React part will come in. Okay? The last uh, or rather, the last two lines of JavaScript in blue tags, lines number 36 and 37, is the React part that's sprinkled on top of the JS. Yes, it's not as fancy. All it actually does is that it, it just prints out the table and does some fancy searching. Okay, and then we also have old school jQuery right there that initializes the main tabular view. Right? So the idea here is that I have so, so where does React come in? This doesn't look like a React app because all I'm really doing is rendering another JavaScript file using the JavaScript to do that. Right? So this is how our pipeline works. Inside our main project, we actually have a, a directory called um, React Components. Okay? Again, this is not the usual way a React developer would do it. But basically, React Components will be our React directory. Okay? So, with the React Components directory, we have, we're using Webpacker. We have our webpack.config.js. And long story short, whatever React quote-unquote mini application we need to sprinkle on top of a JavaScript gets compiled by our Webpacker. So, for example, in the records container, I have there um, the JS file that's written in React called index container. That gets compiled to a file called, uh, if I'm not mistaken, records.min.js. And if you notice the, uh, the, okay, where am I? Okay, so it gets compiled. When, whenever it gets compiled, it gets loaded to the asset pipeline. So yes, we're still using the asset pipeline. Okay, so it gets thrown here in the JavaScripts directory as a compiled version of that product. So it's like doing React but having these small applications written in React.js. Let me just pull out one that's similar. There. We have, we, have, uh, we have these small applications that compiled by a web pack that compiles it to a single JavaScript, and then we just deploy that JavaScript. Okay. So that's, that's the basic idea behind it. And then we just simply call JavaScript in blue tag to our HTML, and then we get to use that code and the app application. So it's very convenient in such a way that we don't really have to depend on things like was mentioned, though, does it run in Heroku, does it run in DigitalOcean, because it's JavaScript. At the end of the day, it's still JavaScript. So it's, it, it, it's actually quite good because even though we don't get to use a fully blown React application, we get to transition that application. We get to evolve that application from a legacy system. We consider the year system in production a legacy system. We get to transition that system into the new world by using React technology or React JS technology. Okay, so that's the basic pipeline, right? We compile. So that's why in my in my project, every time I, I, I fire up my project. I have always that window that continuously compiles the different React, uh, React components. As you can see here, these are my React source code. They get compiled every time I make a change. But these, these uh, React components get compiled to a .min.js file, which gets thrown in the asset pipeline, which in turn is pre-compiled by the Rails application, the Rails 4 application. Okay, and then I can just use it like any other JavaScript. Okay, so that's, that's the very uh, that's our unconventional approach in using React JS in our application. It worked, worked out pretty well. We get to learn about React at the same time. We get to use all that MVCness of Ruby and Rails. Okay, another thing why we decided to use this approach is because what about authentication? If you have a if you have a React application that tries to connect to a Rails API, you have to deal with authentication. But we're so in love with device that we want device to deal with the authentication itself. Yes, we can do the whole token thing, but do we really need that? Do we, eventually, do we have a mobile phone that will be used by millions and millions of Filipino people? No, because it's an internal application. That's why all our API are still governed by device. Right? In fact, if, I, if, you, if you take a look at the component in React,
Right? In fact, if you look at the component in there, uh, this one should call an API there. So our URL, let's say for counting records, is simply an internal URI to the application. So it's still Rails that deals with authentication. No need to worry about tokens because they still log in using your typical device authentication. Okay, so yes, we're old school. Uh, yes, we're old school, but uh, we, we love technology and as software developers, we must always follow the rule of Kaizen, which is continuous improvement. If your software doesn't improve, then it's useless software. So we still try to inject re, uh, React JS uh, little by little. Okay. So that's my rush <laughs> presentation for React. So that's the first part. The second part is the uh, the, the 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 AI part, the artificial intelligence part. And to show this. Uh, I'm also doing, currently doing research on, um, on the academy in terms of neural networks and I've written this paper that attempts to sort of demystify how neural networks work. Demystify in terms of my audience are uh, engineers. Now I like to differentiate an engineer from a, a data scientist. A data scientist's goal is to predict models, to do research, publish papers. Um, an engineer's goal is to implement something. So, even if we don't know the hard math theory behind it, as long as we have specifications, like software development projects, you have a specification, you understand the specification, you implement the specification. That's the this paper. So this paper tries to give you the formula on how neural networks work. So for example, I have a very simple model here for neural network. Neural network is something that does Something that does prediction, uh, classification for a certain uh, problem domain. So in, in the case of our financial application, the, the, the neural network is trying to determine if I give a loan to this person. Credit scoring, basically, which is a typical banking. It's just done by a lot of banks. But again, our audience is the less privileged people, uh, people who don't really weren't given the opportunity to learn all these wonderful things about science. So that's where we're sort of coming off from. So the interesting thing about this paper is that I try as much as possible to give numerical examples, but more importantly, a closed formula as to how neural networks work. Okay? This particular neural network type attempt, attempts to do this thing called reconstruction. Long story short, reconstruction simply means give it a bunch of data. I don't know what that data is, but I'll try to create a model that attempts to reconstruct it. Okay, so for example, uh, in, for, in order for me to do that, I need to identify what are the important features of this piece of data. The first thing I tried this on was actually my, my, my personal uh, celebrity crush, Natalie Portman. So what I did is I got a lot of pictures of Natalie Portman. I vectorized it. So we all know that the pictures is a uh, n by n, by n uh, matrix of pixels. I vectorized those pixels. I fed it to the neural network. And I tried to determine what are the interesting features of Natalie Portman that makes me fall in love with her so much. Okay, that's the basic gist of it. But just to demo that particular uh, aspect, okay, so in terms of credit scoring, you can do the same thing. Get data of the customers, let your model learn, and then tell your model to recommend if, based on this data, I'll recommend a loan to this particular customer. Okay, using features. At the end of the day, they're all numbers in. If you can reduce something to numbers, you can perform some computation against it. Okay, so I'll run the neural network and I'll run it against a simpler data set, just so we can see some results quickly. Okay, I'm using here a data set called Biglot, which is... Okay, so if you see this bunch of drawings of a character called Alphabet of the Magi, or one of the characters of Alphabet of the Magi, what I'll do is I'll run the neural network and try to determine what... Okay, so uh, what does this look like to you guys? Number three. Okay, so I may argue it's the number three. Uh, what other kind of do you think 
this one this space. Aside from it looking like number three. M, aside this M, what else? What's a defining feature that you look at? Okay, all of these share a common trait. The angle, right? What about those two dots? Do we all agree that we have those two dots right there? Okay, so every time you see this character happen, that's character number three of the alphabet of the magic. So neural networks try to simulate this one. As human beings, we identify properly what the interesting features are, and we try to learn from those features. Okay, so around the neural network, uh, this neural network was orig is originally written in um, C++. Okay. So the window there tries to take that data, perform some iterative computation, uh, and then tries to learn what these features are. Okay. It, might, it, it might take a while, but eventually, it will try to sort of dream, hopefully na it will try to dream as to what the interesting features are of this, uh, this set of images. Of course, I downscaled it to a Simpler, simpler model, but as you can see, can we all agree that this sort of looks like the character number three? Does it? What do you think it captured? Because this one is random. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. So what defining feature do you think it actually captured? The curvature. The curvature, right? Because all these things have that sort of um, hope, that hope-like thing. Right? So that's basically how the neural network would work. Taking a bunch of data, of course, it's not as accurate because you have only, if I'm not mistaken, 20 samples that you try to run against it. So taking this data, it will try to analyze what are the important features of this information and try to inject it. So if we translate it to our application, we have a bunch of data. We have all these data in our database, our Rails application. How then do we translate it to, how then do we inject machine learning into it, something like this? analyzing the features, right? Okay, let's use Python, because Python is every data scientist's favorite um, favorite program language for numerical computation. Okay, so I, I consider that. I, I downloaded a book, I bought a book in Python, uh, and then I tried to study Python, but coming from a Ruby perspective, um, uh, sorry for the Python lovers here, but I really didn't love Python. The syntax was less elegant compared to <laughs> compared to Ruby. I still love my Ruby. I still love my Rails. I don't care about speed. Well, I do care about speed. In fact, this neural network is written in C++. But if you actually understand the concept, we're engineers. Like we want to implement, we want to implement things. So yes, you can train the model in C++. In this case, not I C++. Uh, uh, but at the end of the day, if you understand how neural networks work. The only important thing that we really need from a neural network are the weights of the network that dictates how it will actually classify things. Okay, just, just to cut the, the time short now, what we just really need are these lines right here. The, the synapses that actually allows the neurons to fire. What are the most optimized weight of that? What are the most optimized numbers in there, in these lines, that allow us to reconstruct alphabet of the magi that allows us to reconstruct Natalie Portman, that allows us to reconstruct if a person is able to avail of a particular loan. Right? And these numbers can actually be represented by... Okay, I'll show you how, how we represent these numbers. These numbers can actually just be represented by a... Here. By an array of array of weights. Two-dimensional arrays, basically. They're actually three-dimensional three for the entire network. Right? You have a list of matrices and a matrix is just a three-dimensional array. Okay, so you can create whatever model you want using TensorFlow, using Python, using C++. But at the end of the day, once you have that computation, you can take that and then plug it into a model written in Rails. Right? You wouldn't want to, to okay, let's say Python wins the speed contest. Right? So you take that Python module, you still have to figure out how to actually plug it in your Rails application. Right? But at least if you know that you have this JSON structure, then you can use the magic of Rails with it. Okay? That's why, just to show you an example, uh, I've actually re-implemented that same neural network using uh, Ruby.
Okay, let's try to look something like this. The only important method that we actually need Okay, the only important method that we actually need is this thing called the feed-forward method. There, feed-forward. So 33. Actually, Python can do this much shorter, but I try to make it as object-oriented as possible. But basically what it does is that it goes to a topology. A topology is just the, an array of numbers, of integers, that dictates how your neural network so in the case of my example, my neural network is a topology of four in four in the in four in the input, two in the middle, and three as well. So it's it's something generic enough, but this is the only method that you need. It reads through the weights, performs some very basic matrix multiplication, some dot matrices, and then returns it. Returns the, the, the output of the neural network. Okay, so that way, even if you don't understand uh, even if you don't know how to do Python, but you understand the underlying concept, then you can actually use the language that we love the most, which is Ruby, and then perform that same computation because as engineers, all we really need are specifications. The reason why I try to say this is because I've, I've dealt with a lot of people that says, uh, okay, let's integrate neural network to our application or our Rails app, but a lot of people are saying use Python, a lot of people are saying use C++, use TensorFlow, and all these things. But that, that's not the engineering way. The engineering way is to figure out what's the best tool that we actually integrate to our Rails application in something that's very familiar to us just to reduce overhead. Because again, the context is we're dealing with an application that's been running for three years. If you want to change the technology, fight by me, but give me six million pesos for me to do it and some time for me to do it. Okay. So uh, that's basically it. I just, want to, I just wanted to take the opportunity to show you what uh, there are opportunities out there, not only uh, high class programming with all those fancy technology, but there's a lot of audience of the lower sector of society that needs something as easy as Ruby on Rails, something that can be easily adapted by people new to programming. And it's not far away that we can actually use these tools to inject some machine learning into our applications. So I guess that's it for my talk. I'm sorry for the rush and I didn't prepare slides. So hopefully next time if, if I if I will find the time to prepare more. Thank you. Performance is, it, it really performs very, very poorly in terms of training. Training in, you're actually trying to create the model. That's why it's because of that. However, this part, the feed forward part, the prediction part, it's just simple multiplication. And Ruby can do it really as, as fast as Python, as fast as C. Because that's not where the bottleneck is. The bottleneck is in the training part, which can be done by other high class machines. But again, we want to use Ruby because we want to integrate it in our production application. Uh, oh yeah. See. <laughs> Any other uh, questions? No networks are. Uh, it's actually, I, I like the previous presentation because we had slides about Star Wars. Star Wars. Star Wars was actually the thing that got me to program. Uh, not because of Luke and Solo or Darth Vader, but because of, uh, if you remember A New Hope, this, this ugly guy who was, you know, who was confronting Luke Skywalker. Parang sila yun, you know. Parang he, he said something like, uh, I, am one, I own something like 12 systems. But I, I watched it when I was a kid. So what, what got stuck in my head was, was systems. I like to own systems. And then Ruby on Rails came. Lion Connection. But uh, uh, what, I, what I'd like to point out is uh, Ruby because it's a good tool for systems information systems and I hope the new hands will be is.
And I uh, just wanted to mention that this is Star Wars. Uh, any other question? Yeah. Implemented uh, night per night from C++. So, yeah, let's, let's try to differentiate it. This plus version is much shorter because I already used the matrix library for it. The you know, Ruby part, I did a lot of object-oriented stuff. But if you compare this one to, for example, um, the real part, it's basically the same. You look through a topology, do matrix integration. Any other questions? Yeah, I by the way, this code is not the reason I didn't run the Ruby code is because I'm using a matrix library called nmatrix, which as of 0.2.4 broke my code because it's trying to use uh, in the dot each method. You can't understand it yet, but it's, it's breaking my code. And it, it, uh, for those of you who are interested, you can try to fix it. Thank you for having me again.